Bible studies. Now here we are in Hebrews chapter 2, and I'll start reading a verse 14 down through the end of the chapter. And we'll pray, and then we'll dig into these uh, verses together. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Our Father, we pray that in these moments now as we study your word, that your Holy Spirit would confirm these words to our hearts, that we would understand what's before us here, but not just understand with our minds, but that we would apply it in our hearts, that we would draw near to you, and that uh, we would see the importance of you, our God, sending your Son to be our Savior and our High Priest. Help us in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, this chapter, we continue looking here at uh, the, the greater context of uh, the writer of Hebrews discussing why Jesus came to be a human being. And of course, this would be a great challenge to the Jewish people uh, because uh, we know, as, as they know, that uh, there is only one God. There is only one God. This is a big hang-up for a lot of different people, a lot of different religions, uh, to think that there is what we have come to call the Trinity, uh, which is three persons, yet they are one God, one and the same. And that is a real challenge for us. And so the Jews would struggle with this as well, even though they acknowledge the Spirit of God. But to, to accept that God could be in human form, now that is a real challenge. And so uh, the, the writer of Hebrews here is trying to help them to come to this place of understanding intellectually, and then of course in their hearts as well, that it was appropriate, it was good, and it was the perfect plan of God that He would send His Son to become one of us, a human being. And, uh, and so while that was very difficult for the Jews to accept, uh, it is certainly lo logical and, and very understanding and very appropriate. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and that's kind of the, the flow of verse 17. We'll get there in a moment here. Uh, but this is what he's arguing for, that Jesus uh, is, is not an angel. He's better than angels, but he's a human being as well. And he came to save sinners. He came to save the world. And so here we have it now in verse 14. As uh, he continues this discussion, he says, For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, uh, just as, as you and I have flesh and blood. And, and I'm thankful uh, for that because that's how I can, I can see you, I can relate to you, I know you uh, because you are flesh and so am I. And, uh, and so this flesh is wearing out and, and it's, it's getting older, uh, but we've got a new body coming and so we're thankful for that. Uh, yeah, amen. Amen. <laughs> But we've been given this body, and, and so we exist in this way as human beings in, in a body. We are a soul, but we have a body, and we have a spirit. And so Jesus was given a body as well. He was a partaker of this flesh and blood. That's amazing to think about. Uh, 
you know, we, we try to imagine what Jesus would have been like uh, through what is this kind of uh, silent time in the scripture where we just don't know a whole lot about his upbringing. Uh, we know what happened when he was a baby and maybe up through two years old. And then there's kind of a break. And then we get a little glimpse as to what happened when he was 12 year old. And, and then there's a, a, a gap. And, and we don't know what happened between that point and then when he was about 30 years old. And it's hard to, it's hard to imagine what Jesus must have been like in flesh and blood. You know, did he, did he run around? Did he, did he fall down and bang up his knee? You know, and was there blood that, that, uh, that flowed from his knee or something? I mean, you think about these things. He's a, he's a human being. He's a human being. And, and the Bible tells us that, uh, that he wasn't anything special to look at necessarily either. Uh, in in uh, Isaiah 53, you know, it, his, his form wasn't any, anything unique or special. He's just a regular guy, a regular guy, but oh so different. <laughs> And so for us to imagine that and try to, to, uh, uh, to fit the eternal God into a human body is very difficult. But it's fitting, it's appropriate, and it's fact. It's fact. Because he needed to become a human being in order to save human beings from their sin. He needed to be able to taste death for every man, as we saw in verse number 9. He needed to be able to taste death, and if he were an angel, or if he remained a uh, 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 spirit, he would not have been able to taste death. He needed to be human. And so just as you are human, he also is human. I'm thankful for that. Sometimes we... Uh, we elevate Jesus as we ought to, but sometimes we, we elevate him past humanity. Let's remember he's human. And let's remember he was tempted. Let's remember that he suffered as a human, just like you suffer as a human being. And he went through some of the same trials and difficulties that you went through, that you do go through, that you experience even now. You're thinking, well, we're, uh, we're in a real difficult time right now, politically speaking, and all this unrest. You know, what's going to happen? All the insecurity. You think Jesus ever felt that? As a human, I think he did. You know, un under, the, uh, under the rule of the Romans, you know, and, and growing up, we know they learned things. Uh, as, as a human being, he increased in wisdom and stature and faith. Uh, favor with God and man. And so we know that he was learning things. I wonder, now, it, it was never a sin. Uh, he was never uh, worried to the point of, of sinning and losing faith in God. But surely he had some of the same feelings that we have, wondering what's going on, what's going to happen. Sure, he's a human being. He's a human being. You know how he survived? <laughs> and I say survived. What I mean is, the reason he was victorious was because of the Spirit of God living in him. And by the way, you have the same Spirit living inside of you. And so I mention that because I don't want us to take an excuse in some way to say, well, you know, Jesus is God, so we, don't, we can't really be expected to act like him. Well, we can be expected to act like him because we have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us. Uh, so don't use that as an excuse. Um, all right, you got me off on my rabbit trail there. Okay, back to the, the passage here. He is a partaker, uh, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same. Now, now who are the children here uh, that he's talking about? Well, back in verse 13, remember verse 13, he's quoting from Isaiah and he says, uh, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. The children which God hath given me. And so those that are saved, those that are redeemed, the children of God in that sense, uh, those ones that are saved are partakers of flesh and blood. Yes, we are partakers of flesh and blood. 
uh, angels don't get saved. They're not flesh and blood like you and me. They're not humans. They don't get saved. And when they make their choice to turn from God, that's it. There's no redemption. They can't come back. They're reserved for judgment. That's what the Bible says. But not so with human beings. See, we're, we, we start out alienated from God because of our sin. And God gives us the choice to come to Him. And so we have that opportunity to be redeemed. And so the, the children that God has given uh, are flesh and blood. And so Jesus also took part in flesh and blood. The verse continues, uh, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, that, okay, for this reason, through death He might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil. This is an interesting uh, verse here. Him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Uh, we've just come through the, the Halloween season, and, uh, and it's uh, you know, a, a, a dark, I don't, even, I don't think you can call it a holiday. Holiday means holy day. <laughs> that doesn't work, does it? Uh, but it's a very dark time, right? And so uh, people are, are elevating death, you know, and, and, uh, and they're dressing up like the devil. And people have this concept that the devil is in charge of hell and that he is in charge of death. But that is not true. He's not in charge of hell. Hell was prepared for him. <laughs> He'll be there, but not to be in charge of it. He'll be suffering. Uh, and so the, the devil's not in charge of hell. The devil's not even in charge of death. You don't die when the devil comes to get you. You die when God says your time is up. Because who is it that holds the keys of death and hell? It is not the devil. It is Jesus. And so Jesus is in charge of death itself. Well, what does this mean then that, that uh, Jesus gained victory over and, and destroyed him that had the power of death, that is, the devil? Uh, well, let's think a little bit about the devil here. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 12. And of course, we'll be back here in Hebrew, so uh, keep a finger there or uh, put a bookmarker there or something. But let's look at Revelation chapter 12. Uh, here's a description of the devil. In Revelation chapter 12, look with me at verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Uh, there's, there's a lot of context that we could jump into here in the book of Revelation, and we're doing that in the evening services uh, as we study through Bible prophecy. Uh, but just taking this little tidbit here to give us a glimpse and a description of the devil himself. He's called in this passage the accuser of our brethren. The accuser of the brethren. It is the devil that accuses believers and people constantly. And the, the term accuser there has this idea of a lawyer reasoning before a judge. Uh, and so this accuser makes his case. He makes his case and makes the case for the punishment, whatever that may be, and he uses the law to do it. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He stands before God and he makes the case that you deserve to die. Now the devil doesn't make up the rules. The devil doesn't make up the law, but he uses the law that God establishes to make an accusation against you to reason that you deserve to die. And is he right? He is. He is right. 
You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, well, who establishes that rule that the wages of sin is death? Well, that's God himself. It was God who told Adam and Eve, don't eat from this tree because in the day that you do, you will die. He set up the rule. And so now the devil comes before God and says, okay, God, it's your rules. It's not mine. You establish the rule, but look at this person. Look at what they've done. Look at how they live. They don't belong to you. They deserve to die. And the devil accuses you before God constantly. And he uses death to do it. He uses the law to do it. He reasons with the law that God has established to accuse you. And in that sense, he wields the power of death. He doesn't have the power of death, but he uses it. He uses it, the fear uh, of death, to try to, uh, to try to cause you and I to fall into sin or to become discouraged or never to turn to Jesus Christ for salvation in the first place. Let's look at a couple more. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I read these verses yesterday uh, at the uh, graveside. 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, verse 50. Uh, let's start in verse 55. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Well, that's a good question. Uh, why is death so horrible? And why does the grave seem to have victory over us? How does this happen? Well, the answer is here, verse 56. The sting of death is sin. Now, why is it that everybody dies? Because we're sinners. Death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam and Eve sinned, and all of their offspring, that includes you and me, uh, we are sinners as well, and so death was passed upon all men. We all sin, and we all die consequently. So the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin. So we look at the, the law now, if we were to examine the Old Testament law, and we have done this before, looked at the Ten Commandments, just to look at the law, they're very convicting. You don't feel so bad until you look at the law. You don't feel so bad until you study what God's demands are for holiness. When you see those demands and that expectation for holiness, then suddenly you begin to feel very guilty, as you ought, because that's the purpose of the law. It shows you that you are a sinner. It gives strength to sin. It gives strength to sin. And so that guilt comes because of the law. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at this a little more as to how this happens. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We're looking at how the, the law is a tool that brings guilt and that strengthens sin and, and the, uh, the consequence of death hanging over us. This is something the devil uses as our accuser. Romans chapter 7, now I'm going to start in verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? Now think about this. Uh, there are laws of the land. And you have to obey the laws of the land. So long as you're alive, okay? Well, it's the same with, with the law of God. So long as you are alive in this body, you have to obey His law. And there are consequences that come for violating that, that law. That is why... The wages of sin is death. Because eventually you pay, in that sense, for that sin. Although Jesus has done something for us. We'll get to that in a minute. Verse 2, For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. That's why we say, Till death do us part. In our 
vows. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should uh, serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of of the letter. It's an interesting passage and it bears a lot of study uh, to, uh, to dig into that. But I want you to see a little bit farther here in this passage uh, where it also says uh, what the effect of the law is. Look at verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, that's the law, Sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Uh, this is life under the law. Uh, and, and the law is this self-effort system of, of saying, keep and obey the, the commands of God. Do these things. Put in the work, put in the effort, and make God happy with your actions, and you'll be okay. And, and this is that self-effort system that we may have grown up with. Uh, this is a self-effort system that the Jews would have been struggling with under the Mosaic Law, thinking if we just do these sacrifices, if we just wear these clothes, if we just go to these places, or if we just stop doing these things on these certain days and whatever, if we keep all these laws... Then we'll make God happy by our actions and we'll be okay. But it didn't work. The more they tried, the more they realized they failed. And the more they failed, there was another law, then another law, and then another law. And, and every time they turned around, here's another law, bringing alive that sin in them and holding over them this death penalty so that they lived in fear constantly. If we don't obey, we're going to die we don't obey. And so they were in bondage to that law. And, and it is that law that hangs over us so long as we are alive. That is why the death of Jesus is so important. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Let's see, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. There it is, Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins. Now, we've just discussed the effects of law, how it brings this consequence of death in our lives. Yeah, this is where I feel like I am. I'm dead in my sins. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. What a verse. Having forgiven you all trespasses, that death penalty does not hang over you if your sins, your trespasses, the violations of that law have been forgiven and made clean. In other words, you are no longer a sinner in that legal sense. But you are forgiven. What a wonderful thing. How does this happen? Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. 
This is why the death of Christ is so important. Because the wages of sin is death. And every time you break one law, one ordinance, one written law, you deserve death. And what did Jesus do? He suffered death for you. He took all of those violations that you have committed and he nailed them to his own cross. And why could he do that? Because Jesus did not sin. He wasn't suffering for his own sin. He was suffering for your sin. He was suffering for my sin. He took every one of those violated laws that you have committed and he nailed it to his cross. And he took that law out of the way. Why? Because when you're dead, that law has no power over you anymore. No more power over you. You know, we don't, uh, uh, even, even in society today, uh, they're not arresting dead people. Well, that's, that doesn't even make sense. Well, let's apply it to this situation as well, to our own lives. When you're dead, the law doesn't apply anymore. I know what you're thinking. Some dead people are voting and all that. <laughs> but that's a whole other matter. I wasn't going to get political today. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, but you get the idea. You get the idea. The law is, is dead, uh, or when you're dead, the law is, is gone. And so it's taken out of the way. It's taken out of the way. And that's what Jesus does for us. He nailed it to the cross. And in so doing, he spoiled principalities and powers. Why did he spoil them? Why did he defeat them? Why did he defeat the devil on the cross? Because it is the devil that takes that very same law, that handwritten ordinance, and goes to God and says, your child has violated this law. They are no longer yours. They belong to me. They should die. And Jesus says, nope, that's mine. And he takes it on the cross. That's why it's so important that Jesus became a human and died as a human to take care of the law that you deserve, the penalty that you deserve as a human. Wow, that's exciting stuff. And that's what Jesus did for us. He took that law and he fulfilled it uh, and fulfilled the death penalty as well. Well, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 2 here uh, and verse number 15 now. We read verse 14, the, the second half, through death he might uh, destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And this is a real accurate picture of any person who is trying to be religious in some self-effort system. And any, any religion, any supposed church uh, that is teaching an effort-based system of making God happen, uh, happy is, is using this fear of death and keeping their people in bondage. It happens all over the place. And, and we could name a ton of different kinds of religions, but even in supposed Christian religions, Today And I know, I hope you don't think I'm, I'm against or, or I'm, I'm trying to bash other religions all the time. But listen, when, when, a, when a particular religion holds over you the idea that you will go to purgatory and that you will suffer in purgatory unless or, and until somebody who loves you prays you out of there, they are holding fear of death over you and they are keeping you in bondage to that religious system. And I know good Catholics who, who want to know God, but you know they are so deathly afraid to leave their church. They're deathly afraid. Boy, if I left, I might not survive. I might, I might go to hell. I might go to purgatory. Well, you're guaranteed you're going to go there. It's a shame. It's a shame. But you know, even fundamental churches claim to be fundamental churches, Bible-believing churches. Will you go against the word of the pastor? Mm, there's consequences. It's, it's a sad thing. 
that, that even solid fundamental churches would use the fear of death to keep people in bondage. But that's what happens. That's what happens. That's why Jesus came, to deliver us from that fear, to give us liberty. And so he's delivered them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to this bondage. I've got to do it. Got to obey. Got to give the money. Got to go to church. Got to do it. In bondage their whole lives. That's no way to live. Not when Jesus died for us to make, make us free from that. Verse 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. What an interesting verse here. Uh, and and the, uh, the word took on, it's, it's like a, a, a take a hold of, to take a hold of something. In fact, it's the same word that is used in Matthew in, uh, in the account where Peter is walking on the water and he begins to sink down and, uh, and, Jesus, and he reaches out to Jesus and says, Lord, save me, and Jesus takes him by the hand. That's the same word here. Jesus catches him, takes a hold of him to save him. And so that's the word here that we see in this verse. Uh, for verily, he took not on him the nature of angels. or he didn't, he didn't reach out to save angels. He reached out to save human beings. And specifically, the seed of Abraham. And that's a very significant phrase. The seed of Abraham. Yes, Jesus suffered and tasted death for every man. But that salvation, that, that salvation, when he takes a hold of and saves a soul, that is only applied to the seed of Abraham. It's not everybody. It's only the seed of Abraham. Let's dig into that phrase just a little bit, the seed of Abraham. Look with me at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and I got you hopping all over the place tonight, or tonight. We'll do that tonight too. But anyway, Romans chapter 4, uh, verse 13. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or the, the Jews only? Or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. If, if you look at the history, if you, uh, if you look at when Abraham's faith was counted to him for righteousness, it was before he was circumcised. So that work of circumcision didn't save him. It was something else. It was his faith that was counted to him for righteousness. Verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You see, Righteousness is given to those that are of faith. Those that are the children of Abraham, the seed of Abraham in that sense. Verse 12, the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also, but who also walk in the steps of faith that our father Abraham, or of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or unto his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Ah, to the seed of Abraham. This this is attributed, this righteousness is given by faith, not just because of some law or some family connection, uh, but it is by faith. Well, uh, skip ahead in Romans to chapter 9, where he 
narrows this down just a little bit more. So this promise that God has given to Abraham, uh, that he'll be the father of many nations, uh, is applied to the seed of Abraham by faith, not just by some promise, or I'm sorry, by some law or work, but by faith. Now, chapter 9 and verse 6, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The Jews were under the impression that just because they could trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham, they were good to go. But that's not the case. That's not how a person is saved. It is by the promise, and that promise is applied to us by faith. Verse number 9, For this is the word of promise, At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. And so this this salvation is applied not not due to, to some physical lineage or some works that you obey. And so he's narrowed it down. It's not just, it's not just any child of Abraham. He, he narrows it down to Isaac, and he, and he narrows it down even further after that in the passage. And he continues to narrow it down. And I want you to see one more passage, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I know it's in here. Ephesians, oh, I'm too far. Galatians, all right. Chapter 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. You see, the choice of God, the election of God in this sense for salvation is narrowed down to the seed, which is Christ. And the only way that any person ever will be saved and is by decree elect is through Christ. That's it. He is the seed. And that is why he had to become a human being, and not just any human being, but to take on him the seed of Abraham. So that the promises that God hands down to Abraham and to his generations after him, after him, after him, they all believe this promise, this is coming, this is coming, there's coming a Messiah, there's coming salvation, there's coming deliverance. It's all handed down eventually to the seed, the seed, Jesus Christ, and Jesus receives that promise that there is salvation, there is deliverance, and so when he is on the cross, he experiences that sacrifice. Since he is the seed, then all that come to God by him are included in that seed. Just as, Ab- or just as Adam made a choice for all of us, and you're upset about it because you weren't there to get in on the decision, so Jesus made the sacrifice, even though you weren't there. How about that? But in a sense you were, because the Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Wow, you see, it all comes together through the seed of Abraham. So now back to Hebrews chapter 2. It's 1154, and we're wrapping it up right here. Hebrews chapter 2 now, back in verse 16. Verily he took not 
on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So not only does he need to be, or did he need to become a human being in order to suffer death, for us and take care of the law and all of those laws that we violated and get that done. But he also, as a human being, is the perfect mediator. He's the perfect priest that would make reconciliation between a sinful people and a holy God because he is both human and God. And so he is the perfect mediator. And as the perfect mediator, He is the only one that can bring us to God because He is the only one that has every right to reach into both categories. It's amazing. Jesus, God, and man at the same time. It was appropriate. It behooved Him to be made like unto His brethren that He might be a merciful and faithful high priest and the things pertaining unto God. So the things that belong to God see. Jesus can be that go-between and bring the two together and provide that atonement and reconciliation between the two because he is both. And so verse 18, for in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Not only does Jesus fit this category perfectly because he's both, but he also, as a human being, is able to be merciful to us as that high priest because he understands what we go through. And he's also able to help us perfectly because he understands the things that we've been tempted with. He understands it. And so when you pray to God... You're not talking to someone who has no idea what you're going through. You think, well, yeah, because he knows everything. He knows what I'm going through. But no, as a, as a human being, Jesus experienced what you are going through. He experienced humanity. And so he is the, the perfect mediator, the perfect priest the perfect Savior, the perfect captain. He's perfect. And he's all we need. He's all we need. God, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for how you have perfected our salvation by sending your Son to become a man for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to value Jesus more than ever before. And may we take the good news of Jesus Christ to others who do not have it so that they too, no matter what their situation, what their background, where they've been, that they too can be saved and redeemed because they have a perfect Savior in Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him, Father. May we live for him now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.